Hey everyone, I have a quick update before we begin this episode. Unfortunately, this will be the last episode I upload for a while, mainly because I'm moving country and starting a new job. I don't know how long it's going to take for me to settle in and find time within my routine to start doing these episodes again. Combined with the problem that I'm moving to Japan, where I hear the walls are notoriously thin, making narration a spot harder there as well, but I'll see what I can do. So expect a delay because of that. The other reason is because I want to concentrate on getting this book that you're hearing now actually published and available for readers. To do that I need to find a cover, I need to set up a website, I need to sort of develop a social media strategy. Uh, There's a list. A longer list than I anticipated when I first started doing this. So that's all going to take some time as well. And the final reason is that the next part of the story after this chapter is the first battle sequence in the book. And I'm still trying to work out the best format to release that sequence. I might release three chapters all at the same time. I might make one long special episode. Because I want to treat these battle sequences as more of a a package deal, not a week-by-week episode, you know, all at once. A special occasion. So if you don't see anything uploaded here for a while, don't panic. It's all part of the plan, and my own general inability to make content quickly. Sorry for that. But for now, let's enjoy this episode of Apocalypse Awakening, an unconventional narration. Chapter 9 Fruits of Freedom The sun was settling down to sleep for the night, pulling a red cover over the listless town, inviting it to join in its slumber. Amelia would have loved to doze with it. She'd been awake the whole night driving, and the day walking, wearing down her shoes until the soles started to flap and twist with every step. She couldn't stop, not before reaching the patchwork town of orange sands and grey cracked roads she didn't know the name of. The first sand-blasted wooden husks of housing were within throwing distance, nestled against the brown speckled cliffs that had beckoned to her all day. The layer of sweat clinging to Amelia turned from moist and sticky to cold and clammy. The sinking sun was taking back the heat it had lent to the dry air, in the same way Hawker took his money back from spectators in Sawtooth's Rock. Only a different kind of red came out when he collected. At least her burning skin had been soothed by the sunscreen from the men in the ship. Amelia still couldn't figure out what they were after. Maybe they were luring her into a trap, waiting to be sprung in the Lugo apartments. What choice did she have but to continue? There was no other option. Nowhere to walk to. Nowhere that she knew of. Luckily, she'd been to the apartments before, remembered the layout. She would grab more supplies, slip away when the men showed, and start her true journey. A chain-link fence came into view, its curly barbed wire top poking above the low square buildings, blushing in the sunset. The Lugo Apartments. It was plopped right in the middle of town. The fence encasing the apartment's open top floor where lights already shone from the residents' tents, demanding attention against the darkening sky. Amelia lowered her head and focused forward. She'd managed to open her bruised eye in the last few hours. It smarted, but at least she could get a better view of the town sliding by. There were few people wandering the streets, more just sitting around doing nothing. She made sure not to look too long at anyone. Voices shouted from surrounding houses, a ship's engine rumbled overhead, and a truck suddenly rolled past, nearly squashing her on the narrow street, as it carried supplies towards the ramshackle tents and shops inside the apartments. Amelia heard the apartments had once been called a car park, but she dismissed that as a joke. Who would make a park for cars to hang out in? She had to get to the apartments quickly, couldn't spend the night outside with these people lurking in the shadows. A lot of them weren't here to trade. Plundering and raiding was a main pastime in no man's land. Amelia rounded an abandoned car dealership, and there it was. The Lugo Apartments. Lights and torches shining from the gaps between the concrete floors, pockmarked by pillars, all fenced in with gates and mesh. Another cage. 
The lines of light stretched across the empty space between the apartments and the buildings started to lurch from side to side with each step. Amelia realized she was limping, left leg flagging, ankles chafing from her shoes' bite. So close. Amelia left the creeping shadows of the last buildings, apartments climbing higher and higher as she exposed herself to its light and humming generators, shouting men, screaming children, upbeat music, shutting gates. A metal grid was slowly lowering, another portacully, like the rocks, about to seal off the apartments from the desert, and her with it. She started walking faster, faster, ran, ignoring the limp that grated with each jolt. So close! Ten meters! Five! Shocked faces looked out. She didn't care. The gates hit the sand with a thud at the same time as Amelia lunged, whacking her shoulder against one of the bars and sprawling onto the dirt. On the wrong side of the metal. She was becoming sick of shoving her face into the sand. She clutched her shoulder, worrying it had popped loose again, felt the pounding of blood already gathering under her fingers. She picked her face up and crawled to the nearest bar, gripped it and pulled. Her mind flashed back to the rock, in the same position, tugging and yanking. Metal bars, the most horrible invention in history. Amelia pulled again, gaining the same results as she usually did. Tears and frustration. Although these bars had big gaps, her son had had flung through the gate to land safely on the other side. Maybe she could join it, if she just angled her body and squeezed. Back from the gate. I said back. Curfew's in effect. Won't be open till morning. Emilia squirmed out of the gate's grip and stared at the moustached face looming above. His mouth dropped when she turned her face to him. My God. Her vision was smeared with tears, but she saw the pistol in the man's hand. Are you okay? Hey! Amelia reached through the bars and grabbed her hat, picked up her bag, and sprinted back the way she'd come, not giving the man a chance to shoot. She rubbed her eyes and held back the tears, limp really starting to hurt. She returned to the expanding shadows, becoming engulfed in the dark alleys and echoing shouts of the desert town. The sun had been dead for hours, and in its absence, the town had come alive. The desert dwellers of no man's land emerged from their shelter to enjoy the night's coolness and each other's drunken madness. Scraps of music and chatter drifted from the apartments, ships clanged onto empty roofs, and trucks hissed as they screeched around corners and braked short of hitting the children running through the streets, horns blaring at their jackal-like laughter. Emilia pulled the blanket closer to her, frayed edges tickling at her chin. She kept a sleepy, unbruised eye on the doorway, its gaping shadow a shade lighter than the black around it. She huddled in the darkest corner of the room, on top of a dust mattress stuffed with rubble. She had swaddled herself in the blanket and squirmed in the pile of debris, trying to steal some comfort by moulding the loose stones around her. She sat frozen, not daring to move, and ruined the makeshift bed. The holster and pistol sat outside of her cocoon, within easy reach. Even an empty gun was better than none. Amelia kept telling herself this was perfectly warm and cosy. Only her body told her the hallowed cask of a house was freezing and miserable. But if she thought the opposite, then maybe her mind would believe the lie. Her fingertips and toes were chilly, and her skin still burned, only somewhat soothed by the lotion she'd rubbed on, adding to the sand, grime, sweat, and dried blood coating her. Like a slab of cold meat wrapped in dirty, boiling bacon. She didn't even want to dwell on the matted mess of knots that had replaced her hair. A chorus of ferocious barks exploded a few streets away. A set of voices shouted back, and Amelia heard the thumping of stones being thrown at the fighting animals. Street dogs. She was terrified of dogs. They could detect her fear better than any human. Never had met one that didn't want to growl and bite at her. She pulled the blanket even tighter. Her feet popped out the end, brushing the dust crumbs that formed one end of her bed frame. It was impossible to tell the time. Amelia had no smart gauntlet, 
No gauge on how slowly her waking mind crawled through the night, on how many more hours there were to endure. She nearly laughed out loud at how hopeless the situation was, but stopped herself when she remembered the skulking men on the streets outside. There had been a few of them as Amelia snuck back, and sure enough, they all had guns. It would be weird not to have one in no man's land. Her shoulder ached and throbbed from where she'd bashed it against the gate, but the pain was almost pleasant. It demanded attention, distracting from everything else. If only she'd been a minute quicker, then she would have gotten inside the apartments, safe with the tents and refugees. Well, not exactly safe, still amongst outcasts and thieves, but better than out here, where the more violent types lingered. Amelia shivered, despite the lack of another windy draught. The way the bars of the apartments came down, sealing everyone inside, just like the cages in the rock. She'd been so keen to be locked in again, to run away from one enclosure and throw herself into the next. Not exactly the path she'd been hoping for. Where were the green fields and comfortable beds? The plentiful food, fashionable clothes, and kind men. All the things the woman at the rock had promised her. None of it was here. There was only one place that resembled the woman's fairy tales. The place she'd been aiming for all along. Shank Mora. The city brimming with palm trees, white beaches, and bright blue water. She'd travelled to it on a ferry, freed from the main slab of no man's land by the ocean. Amelia had only been there once, for the briefest of times, but she'd never forgot what happened. It was a few years ago when she'd walked that sandy, straw-strewn street, lit by flickering orange torchlight and the moon's pale, waxy rays. Quidel had never been more than a step away from her, not that she'd considered running. Not that time. She'd been too scared of the people. So many of them. Hundreds. Maybe more. And these people had been strange, singing off-tune songs, arguing in slurred, happy voices. Shouting, not in anger, but just because they could. Some danced next to large boxes, tumbling music out onto the street. Smoking and cursing, kissing and chatting. It wasn't the acts that had shocked her. It was the way no one seemed to care about what anyone else did. And weirdest of all, the women were doing it too, smiling and talking with one another, sharing drinks and chortles of laughter. No collars, no chains, no owners. Free to do as they pleased, completely in control of their own worlds. That was what scared her most of all. Were they really the same species? Hawker had been with them. Amelia remembered because he'd annoyed Quidel. Right, good luck with the job. I'm off to conduct business with my drunken clientele. It was only later that Amelia found out the city was celebrating something called Independence Day. Hawker, don't you dare! Ah, fuck it. Come on, Fuse. It wasn't the first time someone had disobeyed Quidel. Made her realise, despite how much she said it, Quidel wasn't all-powerful. Only Sawtooth was truly unstoppable. They'd taken her beyond the huts and bonfires to a quieter side street, where a single man stood with his back to them, pissing against a wall. Amelia was more used to that. Right, come here! Quidel turned and knelt. He'd changed since that night, when his mohawk was shorter and his skin smoother. She'd changed too. Back then, her body was still developing, breasts and hips still growing, and she felt embarrassed as Quidel scanned her, looking at the faded blouse and torn skirt they dressed her in. Looks good to me. Fuse leered from behind, fat tongue lapping. Shut up! Now, girly, you need to be convincing here, so I need you to look sad. Real. Wow. She's a good actor, she is. Amelia hadn't been acting. She'd let her mask drop, and they'd actually been paying attention for once. Good. Now listen. I need you to do everything like we said. Got it? Quidel had never sounded so pleading before. 
she'd almost expected him to say please. If you do this right, you'll make Master Sawtooth proud. But if not, you'll be very disappointed. Understand? She hadn't been given permission to speak, so she only nodded. Of course she had. She knew Quidel was manipulating her, but that didn't matter. There was no way she'd let Sawtooth down. I said fuck off. Can you not? The man who opened the door faltered. He glanced around the empty alley, looked back down at her. What are you? A stray? Amelia tilted her head, slightly to the side like she'd been taught. Let the fear on her face speak for itself. She had plenty to display. What's the matter? Don't understand me? You got a translator? She didn't react to the words like she'd been told. Just gave him another baffled look. Guess not. Be too easy if you did, wouldn't it? Well, shit. He was slightly tubby, the eyebrows meeting in the middle, but his face had been honest, quick to display a pitying mouth and concerned lines on his forehead. Why did she always remember this part so well? Oh, I don't know what to do with you. He gritted his teeth and started shifting his weight from one leg to the other, looked along the alleyway again. She had tried to look away from his face, from the worried eyes and spread of whiskers around his jaw, had tried not to memorize this, but that only made the memory stick harder. Well, perhaps I could. Oh, fuck, this is risky. Had to happen on my shift too, didn't it? He was hesitating. She'd been instructed what to do if this happened. Amelia cast her eyes to the ground, turned on her heel, and began slouching away. Ah, oh, fucking wait! Wait, wait, wait! What's right? Back here. Might as well come in. The inside light jumped out of the doorway and into the alleyway to greet her. The next bit was less vivid. Maybe this part didn't need to be relived so much because watching the man struggle with his emotions, choosing to take her side, was the part Amelia really hated. The rest was decided as soon as he opened the door into that house filled with the weird smelling packages. Only one other thing stood out, just because of how unusual it was. The object she'd used to bash the man's head in and smash apart the soupy insides. It had been heavy and solid, a metal model of a purple hooded figure holding a curved blade. Amelia asked the woman later, amongst the darkness and whispers, what the figure meant. They had begrudgingly told her, the Grim Reaper of Death. A shot banged in the night, and Amelia jumped in her blankets, ruining the shaped bed of rubble. The sound faded, and panicked shouts, louder than ever, took back control. Mind present again, Amelia felt the fresh tears on her face. Dared not wipe them away and disturb her semi-sleepiness any more. She was annoyed at the damp cheeks. She'd escaped the rock, not only to get away from the men, but also from these memories. Away from the unseen army of regrets, waiting to drag her down until she no longer wanted to move. Why had her mind wandered along that path again? Shankamora. There'd been death and suffering, and it hadn't felt right killing that man. The same way it hadn't felt right killing Green. At least there had been less death and more joy in some parts of that rickety city. People living completely different lives, far away from Sawtooth's men. Free girls and women wandering around as they pleased. That's what fascinated Amelia. It had formed her picture of liberty. Instead, a lonely game of survival awaited, scrabbling from one cage to the next to avoid the flatness and death of the desert. She could choose to follow along or die. Only the strong got to truly roam as they pleased out here, and without any ammunition, she was no match for the desert thugs. Amelia's throat gulped and stuck, parched. She risked moving an arm from under the blankets to take a sip of water from the depleting bottle. Made her think of the two men that had given it to her. Kind men. The woman had promised they existed, but Amelia found that to be the most ambitious promise of all, even more ludicrous than the floating fortresses and megacities to the south. Maybe the ones who'd given her supplies in the desert weren't so bad. 
and what they'd said about Rusk. Was she free because of these men? Maybe she should have talked, given them that little in return. It seemed people did that whenever they pleased out here. She had gone through all the effort to get here. How much harder could it be to open her mouth? Amelia knew it actually wouldn't be easy at all, but right now she was content with lying to herself. The action many hours away from her fantasies in bed. It made her feel a little better. Gave her something to cling on to, throughout a night where there was nothing else.